Hello, my lovely anatomist and physiologist, Michelle Gloss here, and we are ready to get into some specifics on the endocrine system. So we're going to be starting in this video with the hypothalamus and then also the pituitary gland. So let's remind ourselves of where these are located. So I have a photo of the brain model. This is a sagittal cut. Of the brain model. And remember our hypothalamus is at the base of our diencephalon. And then we have a hanging underneath the hypothalamus, this little like P-shaped gland called the pituitary gland. And notice that there is a tissue that connects these two structures to each other and that is referred to as the infundibulum. Infundibulum. So I always like to um, kind of pronounce it how it's spelled to help myself. In this image over here, this is from that um, model that we looked at when we went over like what are the different endocrine glands and here we're looking just at the hypothalamus tissue here again we're at the base of the diencephalon we have our stalk called the infundibulum and then we have our pituitary gland here hanging down below. And remember that we can actually label our different lobes of our pituitary gland. So we have at the front, we have what we can call the adenohypothesis. We have the posterior lobe, which we can call the neurohypothesis. And then remember we have that kind of space in between, which we can refer to as the pars intermedia. Now looking at this diagram here, I want you to see that there's a collection. They've colored them as like this red collection of neurons and this orange collection of neurons. And notice that the cell bodies of those neurons are located in the hypothalamus, but then the axons are hanging down into the neurohypothesis. So this is actually one of the reasons I like to use the term neurohypothesis rather than the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, because it helps us to remember the neuro connection um, that's happening here. So we're seeing these are actually hypothalamic neurons extending down into the neurohypothesis. So we're going to see there's a couple of hormones that these uh, neurons are producing in the hypothalamus, but then the release is happening here at the neurohypothesis. As we talk about these two glands, you can see I've kind of labeled my hypothalamus as my big boss um, kind of in charge of the endocrine system. And then I've talked about my pituitary gland here as like my middle manager. And so the idea here is the hypothalamus, we can say, is sort of like our command center for the endocrine system. It's a very much coordinating the neural endocrine systems or neural endocrine response. And again, that's this connection of the hypothalamus is actually, it's actually neural tissue, right? We're located here in the brain. And then when we talk about it as like the big boss, what we're going to see is it's going to produce what we can call regulatory hormones. And the regulatory hormones are going to be either releasing hormones or they're going to be inhibiting hormones. And these are going to be the hormones that are going to really be talking to that adenohypothesis specifically. So very much I like to think about my hypothalamus as that big boss because it's pretty much in charge 
if you want to think of it in that way, it's pretty much in charge of the adeno hypothesis. So I like to think about this as, you know, for me at um, Northeast State Community College, you know, my big boss would be the president of the college. And on the daily, um, I don't interact very much with the president of the college, right? So the president of the college is not monitoring my schedule, is not paying attention to whether I show up every day, is not dealing with you know student complaints or issues, right? Instead, the supervisor who does all that stuff for me is actually the dean of sciences. So I report directly on the day-to-day -to, -day to the dean of sciences. So I'm thinking of my pituitary gland as like my middle manager, or like my dean of sciences, right? That would be for me. When I worked in restaurants, then the hypothalamus would be, my analogy here would be like the corporate manager, like you never see the corporate manager, the person you do see is the shift manager, right? Who makes your schedule, um, tells you like what section uh, of the restaurant you're working at that day and you know, all of that um, sort of sort of thing. If you have to call in sick, you call into your shift manager, right? So that's like the pituitary gland. When we talk about the hypothalamus having this um, kind of in charge relationship to the Dino hypothesis, it's important for us to pay attention to number one, these are anatomically very close to each other. So the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland are anatomically very close, they're connected through that infundibulum. But the other thing to pay attention to is all of this communication between these two glands is happening with hormones. And we've said that hormones travel through body fluids, specifically bloodstream, yeah? And so we don't want a hormone from the hypothalamus to go in the blood, travel all the way to big toe, and then come all the way back to the pituitary gland when they're right here close to each other. And so what we have instead is we have what we can describe as a, um, let me put it right here, hypophysial portal system. And a portal system is where you have a network of capillaries that are connected to each other. So we have a set of capillaries in the hypothalamus, and then we have a set of capillaries here at the pituitary gland. And we do have, of course, blood vessels that are connecting these two capillary beds to each other. And this whole relationship is described as the hypophysial portal system. So this is something that we can talk a little bit more about in our lab section. And it's helping us to understand this relationship maybe a little bit better. When we are talking about the pituitary gland, we are, remember, talking about these three distinct regions. So we have the neurohypophysis in the posterior lobe, we have the pars intermedia between, and then we have the um, adenohypophysis in the anterior lobe. And so we will see there's some differences in the hormones that are released there. The reason I have the pituitary gland here listed as my middle manager is specifically when we look at the adeno hypothesis, we'll see the release of seven, what we can describe as tropic hormones. And for me, when I see this description of tropic, I interpret this in my mind to turn on and so I'm given actually pituitary gland this green um, pin because it's green for go. And so the pituitary gland is going to be the adenohypothesis specifically is going to be releasing tropic hormones in the blood that's going to be turning on other endocrine glands. So we can think about the pituitary gland is really having this role of kind of coordinating the other activities. And that's why I've kind of designated it here as my middle manager. Let's go ahead here and talk about that neurohypothesis just a little bit more. And then we're going to really focus in on those seven tropic hormones from the pituitary gland, as well as the regulatory hormones from the hypothalamus. Remember those hypothalamus neurons we're seeing in this diagram here, like the red set and the orange set, they're producing hormones that are being released at the neurohypothesis.
So we can credit the neurohypothesis as storing and releasing two important hormones. So the neurohypothesis is really like storing and releasing two important hormones. And these hormones are described as oxytocin, which can be abbreviated OXT, and then antidiuretic hormone, which we're going to abbreviate as ADH. And we're going to talk about this one a bunch, so I'm going to actually highlight it for us, making sure we're paying close attention to this one. Antidiuretic hormone. Oh my goodness, y'all, it comes up in cardiovascular system. It comes up in the urinary system. It comes up when we talk about the regulation of our body fluids and our electrolytes. So, so we'll talk about it again and again and again. It'll become an old friend. Let's go back to this hormone oxytocin. So as we pay attention to each of our hormones, we are keeping up with the following pieces of information. We need to know the name of the hormone, and if it has an abbreviation, we need to be equally well-versed in the abbreviation. So we should equally well recognize oxytocin and OXT, okay? So that's one kind of piece of information. We need to know where each hormone is being made and released. We need to know where each hormone is being made and released. We need to know what are the target tissues for each hormone. We need to know the target tissues for cells for each hormone. And then we need to know like the mechanism of action for the hormone or like how those target cells respond. So the name and abbreviation, who's making it, who is the target tissue and how that target tissue responds. Linked in your video descriptions, I have a spreadsheet that I've produced for you with the full list of all the hormones that we cover and it's set up in that kind of a table. So it gives you a nice kind of place for you to organize your information and maybe practice your information. So you might want to take a look at that. Again, it's linked in the um, video description. Okay, so when we're talking about the neurohypothesis, it's storing and releasing these two hormones, specifically oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. Let's talk a little bit about oxytocin. Oxytocin is going to target cells of the uterus, and it's going to be important in triggering uterine contractions that are occurring during labor, labor and delivery. So oxytocin, oxytocin is going to be targeting cells of the uterus and responsible for triggering uterine contractions during labor and delivery. We also see it um, targeting your mammary glands. And we'll see it involved in what is described as your milk letdown reflex. So that's not actually the making of milk, but that's actually the milk moving into the ducts and then being accessible for the infant. Also, oxytocin is described as like the love hormone. So this is going to be an important hormone in the case of creating a bond between the um, the, the mother and the infant, right? The person who has gone through the pregnancy, the labor and delivery, and is breastfeeding um, this infant. And then we can also see this hormone showing up in, as a love hormone in other relationships as well. And then um, we also see it involved in part of the sexual uh, response as well. So we'll talk about it again during the reproductive um, system. When we look at the antidiuretic hormone, this one is going to target the kidney, and it's actually going to increase water reabsorption, or you can say, you might like to say retain water, retain water, meaning you're not going to make a lot of urine. You're keeping the water in the body. You're not making a lot of urine. 
We sometimes see this um, hormone described as vasopressin. So you might have seen that name used before. We'll see that we um, release this during deep sleep. So that's how we can be asleep, you know, for like eight hours. Not only are we not taking in fluids, but we're not uh, feeling the need to urinate. Or if you're struggling with sleep, you might have a feeling of needing to urinate quite a lot, which can disrupt your ability to like fall asleep, right? So we see antidiuretic hormone being released during our deep sleep. And we do see that this hormone is inhibited by alcohol. So this is why when you're starting to drink a lot of alcohol, you might really feel a strong need to urinate frequently and that leads to the dehydration that can lead to the um, hangover feeling from having a lot to drink. Okay, so we've talked quite a bit, so I'd like to stop this video here and I'm gonna pick right back up looking at the relationship between the hypothalamus and the adenohypophysis in our next video. So please stay tuned. As always, take care of yourselves and each other.